Bonjour et bienvenue aux Rencontres de la Librairie, l'émission de la Librairie 1.3 en partenariat avec Radio Lodel. Ces rencontres permettent de découvrir ou redécouvrir un auteur, un artiste, au cours d'un débat, d'une conférence, d'une exposition. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes le 16 novembre, une excellente occasion d'être à la marge de l'Amérique du Nord. William Boy, vous êtes né et avez grandi dans le quartier de Grebsand, à Brooklyn. Vous avez exercé le métier de disquaire spécialisé dans le rock américain indépendant au magasin The End of All Music. Je ne sais pas si c'est la fin de la musique, mais c'est aussi le début de l'écriture. Vous vivez aujourd'hui à Oxford, dans le Mississippi. Vient de paraître en septembre 2021, en grand format chez Game Master, votre livre La Cité des Marches. William Boyle, bonjour. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. À vos côtés, Clotilde, de chez Game Master, qui assurera la traduction. Clotilde, bonjour. Bonjour. Alors, dans le quartier de Brooklyn, fin des années 90, ambiance de flic tripou à la perspective de carrière limitée, dont l'ambition se borne à finir la journée et le futur ne dépasse pas le coin de la rue et ses pintes de bière. Vos personnages semblent ne pas avoir de futur. Chaque action est impulsive et sans en mesurer les conséquences. Loin du rêve américain vendu à toutes les sauces. Quelle est donc l'Amérique que vous décrivez uh, I think I am uh, describing an America of, kind of dead ends and kind of crushed dreams. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's where my where my obsessions often take me. Those are the characters that I'm interested in from a storytelling perspective, but also um, otherwise, I just like characters who live their lives on, on the margins, who are often in desperate situations or their lives are in some kind of, um, they're in some kind of crisis. Um, so I think that's, that's something I've always been drawn to as a reader and a viewer uh, and a listener. Um, so it's where I gravitate as a, as a writer as well. Dans la Cité des Marges, un des personnages, Nick, est un professeur qui se rêve écrivain. Il cherche un sujet pour son livre. Cette quête est-elle aussi liée à la peur de la page blanche ou c'est votre recette pour chercher un sujet Est-ce que votre quartier est source de votre inspiration Ce sont les deux axes de la question. Uh, yeah, my neighborhood is, is definitely a source of my inspiration, not in the same way that it is for that character of Nick, though. Yeah. Uh, um, We, uh, Nick, is, Nick is kind of a, I mean, he's somebody who wants um, kind of a shortcut to some kind of minor fame or success without having to do any of the work. So he just kind of plucks up what he thinks of as a compelling story um, and tries to imagine it as his own, even though he doesn't have the ability or the wherewithal to actually tell the story. Um, so yeah, Nick is, I mean, Nick is a, he's failure, but in a, in a way that is not, he's not a beautiful failure. He's more of a, just kind of a, somebody who doesn't want to do the work even, um, and doesn't succeed at anything because he's not even trying. Um, But yeah, for me, the, the neighborhood is a, a big inspiration and it's, it's where, when I sit down to write, it's the first place I return to in my mind and, and uh, you know, the, the thing that uh, made me want to tell stories in the first place and, and continues to, to make me want to tell stories. It's what I'm haunted by most. Depuis l'amitié est un cadeau à se faire, l'ambiance de vos romans noirs s'égaye tout en décrivant une Amérique échouée, déprimée. Est-ce que l'humour qui transparaît dans vos ouvrages est un mal nécessaire pour présenter la tristesse de ceux qui sont à la marge? Um, I don't know if it's necessary, but it's what I it's what I enjoy. I think, you know, in a in a way, um, I think all of my books have a dark comic element, um, but I think I probably didn't succeed as it at it in the first uh, two or three in the way that I thought I did. But with A Friend is a Gift You Give Yourself, it was more clearly a comedy, and City of Margins has more um, comic elements too, I think. Um, and my next book, Shoot the Moonlight Up, has, has those as well. I don't know that it's, it's um, necessary, but I, I do think, to me, it's something I've always, it's a way of balancing out the darkness, certainly, but it's also a way of 
you know, I often I like to make weird decisions in my writing and, and do strange things. And um, that's one of the ways that that kind of manifests itself in the work is that I have characters in uh, strange situations um, and really they play out like comic set pieces. Pour continuer un petit peu sur les caractères, dans la cité des marges, ce livre se construit dans la proximité, toujours le voisinage, le quartier. Chaque chapitre est consacré à un personnage, son point de vue, euh, Denis, Pads. Vos personnages se croisent, se rencontrent, se connaissent. Euh, comment vous construisez cette succession de, euh, de personnages et surtout leurs liens um, I, you know, I, I like, I've always been drawn to big ensemble casts. Um, I think probably, you know, my first exposure to that was through, through films um, by one of my heroes, Robert Altman. Um, and, you know, I kind of just fell in love with that storytelling structure of just having a lot of characters swirling around each other and their lives occasionally intersecting or there being connections in some way that you um, you might not see, but you know as a reader. Um, so, I, you know, it was really Robert Altman's films that, that got me into that style of storytelling early in my life or got me interested in it at least. And, and when I started um, working on novels, um, I, you know, Gravesend had three points of view and Lonely Witness only had one and Friend is a Gift, I went up to five and the City of Margins is, is seven or eight, I can't remember. Um, and I just, you know, I, I realized I liked having that, that wider cast. Um, it just kept things from getting stale for me as a, as a writer. I liked being able to shift between them and, um, and just gave the, the narrative some natural movement and pacing that I, I really um, enjoy. As for planning, I, I think I just, you know, I, I usually sit down at the beginning of the book and kind of figure out the structure, you know, I have a fairly good idea of what I want to do, but I also leave room for changing things and wandering around within the narrative. Alors, on développera les questions des personnages un petit peu plus tard, mais euh, dès le début, j'ai l'impression que vous nous laissez croire, en tout cas, que vous, vous allez peut-être parler de fatalité lorsque Denis évoque le futur de, de Mickey, euh, qui finira comme son père. Donc on parlera un petit peu de, du père de Mickey un petit peu plus tard. Vous parlez peut-être aussi de rédemption euh, lorsque, dans le premier chapitre, on découvre le personnage de Denis, qui est le, le flic ripou mais que, dès le deuxième chapitre, on a l'impression qu'il change et qu'il, par amour, en découvrant euh, une rencontre inattendue auprès de d'Ava. Euh, mais bien sûr, nous sommes dans les premières pages du livre. Alors, est-ce que tout ça, c'est qu'une façon de nous faire croire que vous allez parler de ça Est-ce que l'amour est une voie de sortie Est-ce que vous avez l'impression de suggérer dès le début avant, évidemment, que la violence ne revienne. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just, I like um, messy characters, characters that are very complicated. And um, I really, you know, part of part of this book to me, or the, the impetus for the book was to write about this character, Donnie, who um, we see do something bad in the beginning. And then the next time we see him, he's doing something good. He's helping Ava, who's broken down on the side of, um, the highway and then it really kind of appealed to me to have part of the book play out like a love story where one of the one of the people in the love story was kind of a monster um, and you know that was you know part of my original thinking about the book and my way of thinking about about Donnie as a character but I don't think I was you know I wasn't Initially, at least, I wasn't really thinking about um, redemption and forgiveness so much with him. But I think some of that stuff became clearer to me as I was working on the book. And I started to actually care about this monster a little bit, um, which I, I guess is the ultimate effect I would want creating a character like that. Somebody who's 
awful who you still can feel something for. Restez dans l'idée de, de la société que vous décrivez auprès des, de, dans cet ouvrage. Euh, est-ce que c'est une violence des gens ou est-ce que c'est une violence de la société? I don't know if I think about it in those terms when I'm when I'm doing the work, but I think you know I, I definitely have the characters who are who are a product of of their environment and who. Um, because of the options that they have or haven't had in life have been trapped into bad decisions. Um, and so, you know, I think probably on some level, yeah, it's a, it's a product of, of the society. En, en restant dans, dans un contexte qui est celui du, du quartier, tel un huis clos, euh, à une époque où tout bouge, évidemment, est-ce que c'est une façon de rappeler aussi que l'aventure est au coin de la rue Well, I wanted to, I mean, this book is set in the 1990s, so I wanted to go back to the southern Brooklyn that I knew growing up. And, you know, I, I think I'm always thinking about, you know, characters who are, are especially the younger characters, like in this book, uh, Mikey and Antonina are yearning to get out of the neighborhood or, or you know, kind of on the on the verge of, of breaking away from feeling trapped by the place. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully that sense kind of pervades the book. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of the things about growing up in a, a neighborhood like this, which is part of New York City, which is, you know, massive cultural, you know, a great city, but this is a kind of end of the line neighborhood in the, in the outer boroughs um, where you can still have kind of a small town mentality or small town experience um, ultimately. So I, I like messing around with, uh, with characters who are trapped by that. Euh, vous faites la description d'une société américaine perdue ou lasse, d'un monde d'argent et de sexe et de flingues, et dont la seule échappatoire semble être d'agir par impulsion et guidée par ses seules envies. Est-ce une ode à se foutre de la vie ou de la mort Que oh. reste-t-il de la morale éventuellement Je pense que, encore une fois, j'aime les choses qui sont complexes et compliquées, donc je pense qu'il y a there's usually a double action in the world of my stories between myself and mothers who are still very religious and kids who are, you know, breaking, breaking away and um, having all sorts of experiences that, that maybe their, their parents um, never knew. And they're, you know, they're going outside of the neighborhood. They're going into Manhattan and drinking in bars in Manhattan and going to shows in Manhattan. Um, so I don't know if I have, I don't sit down with a, a, a moral vision in mind or anything, but I like the interplay of all these complicated characters with their, with their faith, some of them with their faith, some of them with their, their doubt, some of them with their, you know, disavowal of everything, their hatred for, for everything, their loss, their regret, their grief, um, all, of, all of those things. Got it. But I do, I do think that ultimately there is probably some sense of a, a, a code of, of goodness that, that the good characters do abide by, you know, at least have good hearts abide by. Alors, je ne sais pas si vous avez eu euh, déjà l'occasion de lire le, le livre. En tout cas, sur les premiers chapitres, je vais vous donner un petit peu l'ambiance dans laquelle on se plonge, parce qu'on va rentrer un petit peu dans le, dans le contenu de l'ouvrage. Donc, dès les premières pages, l'ambiance se pose. Donny, un flic ripou et violent, brutalise donc Mickey, qui draguait la jeune, la jeune Antonina. Mickey est le fils de Guesepe, que Donny va suicider par-dessus un pont euh, quelques heures plus tard, alors qu'il devait simplement le bousculer pour récupérer une dette pour le compte du caïd local. Vous avez bien compris, donc euh, le flic travaille aussi pour le caïd local. Bref, flic ripou. Fin du premier chapitre, c'était en 1991. Euh, le second chapitre commence en... 1993, Donny devient Don et rencontre Ava. Que s'est-il passé entre 1991 et 1993, à part le changement de président de Bush à Clinton Mikey, 
in the schoolyard and, and winds up hitting Mikey with the bat and then later killing his father. Um, that's the, the opening of the book. Um, so then we jump ahead a couple of years where I think uh, Donnie has been um, he was a he was in that prologue. We met him as a as a bad cop, um, and a kind of off the rails cop. And when we return to him, he's been kicked off the force. Um, he's no longer a cop. And he's just kind of working as a strong arm guy for a, a a mobster. And other things have happened in in that intervening time too. The the other main characters, Mikey and Antonina have grown up a little bit that we met earlier in the book. And Mikey's been shaped by the loss of his father, which he believes to have been a uh, suicide. Vous me direz, si j'ai bien compris votre histoire, entre violence, sexe et argent, Mike n'arrive pas à s'engager avec Alice, qui est magnifique, sensuelle, ambitieuse et qui rêve surtout de partir de son trou. Donnie tabasse Mickey, Donnie tue, pardon, Guiseppe. Mickey, le fils de Rosemary et Guiseppe, rencontre Donna, l'ex de Donnie. Mickey a été l'élève de Nick. Nick est le fils d'Ava. Rosemary est l'employé d'Ava. Donnie devient Don et rencontre Ava. Rosemary a un fan. Nick veut écrire une histoire sur Donnie. Euh, pourquoi on a l'impression que ça se barre en cacahuète Yeah, you know, I, I just, I loved, uh, I loved, I kind of lost the, what the question was there, but I, uh, I, I, I lost you when you do that. Yeah, which makes sense given the, the nature of the, the book, I guess. There, I mean, I just, you know, I love, I love, um, as I said earlier, I think I love that structure of having just all these characters whose lives are interconnected in some way. And you, you wonder how and when they will cross paths or, you know, if they're connected in the past, as many of them are. And I like, you know, I think I just like the idea of this is something I grew up feeling very strongly in my neighborhood, that you could live in a a neighborhood like that and live a hundred feet away from somebody and never know them but have these connections to them um, and that's just again one of one of my one of my obsessions as a writer I think and you know in this book I really just <coughs> stretched the canvas a little bit and kind of <clears throat> made those connections wilder and more more um, relying on chance and coincidence. Encore plus que le précédent ouvrage, La Cité des Marges est un roman noir dans un style qui fait penser presque aux autres villes, ce que j'ai essayé de décrire précédemment. Euh, Croiser de personnages, espace limité, euh, mais avec la violence, le sexe et l'argent. Comment réussissez-vous à construire en fait votre récit sans vous emmêler les pinceaux Oh, well, one way is I keep the, um, the, the time period pretty compressed in my books. And I, I, I usually say I'm a coward when it comes to time. I don't have my novels take place over many years. Um, the prologue takes place um, over, you know, one, one night in um, one year. And then the rest of the action takes place a couple of years later um, over a few you know a few days or a week or something like that so um that's a way for me of of compressing you know everything and not losing track of it um beyond that i mean it's just you know pretty it's not usually hard for me when i'm in the book to to not get lost um i think the since i have the structure figured out usually and i know whose chapter is going to belong to who Uh, it helps me keep things straight, and I don't, I don't have one of those like big boards with strings going everywhere. But I, you know, I kind of, I guess I kind of have that in my mind, and then I have a uh, just a, a document I keep open where I kind of keep updating it and keeping track of connections and things I need to come back to. It's vrai que dans la construction de votre ouvrage, euh, en fait, vous foutez un peu le bordel dans les clichés pour écrire avec humour un roman noir qui peut tourner à la romance ou est-ce plutôt une romance qui dégénère C'est vrai qu'entre les deux premiers romans et les deux derniers, vous avez quand même évolué d'une certaine façon pour mêler l'humour au roman noir. I like books and films that shift tones a lot. Um... And so, yeah, I, I mean, I consider myself a, a crime novelist, but I also 
like to wander away from that within within the world of the story, um, just because that that's something that interests me. So I, I think with City of Margins in particular, one of the things I, I had very much in mind was uh, melodrama, um, which I am I love uh, Douglas Sirk films and. Um, I think of a book like uh, Carson McCullers' Reflections in a Golden Eye um, and kind of the, this, um, you know, where, the, where the, the drama gets taken beyond reality. Um, and, I, you know, so I, I think in this book I leaned um, more heavily into that. And A Friend is a Gift You Give Yourself. It was more of a screwball comedy mixed with a crime story and in City of Margins it was more of a uh, what I, I don't know that this will translate but what I would have called it a noir melodrama. Donc pour vous en fait on peut imaginer qu'un roman noir euh, peut-être joyeux ou est-ce qu'on peut imaginer aussi que dans ce cadre là dans un roman noir il peut y avoir euh, imaginant dans un rêve. <laughs> well yeah I mean I think that's something I've I've shifted on in the last couple of years, probably, I think. When I was a little bit younger, I liked kind of relentlessly bleak uh, stuff, and I liked endings to be particularly bleak. Um, but I think both of these books, I was I was looking for a little way to, to find hope and to, to give some of these characters that I, I really love um, better endings than just dying in the street or whatever. In, in both of these books, it comes down to family, um, just the idea of making making your own family, um, and, you know, finding some some something, you know, to live for in that. Rassurez-vous, il y a des morts aussi. Yeah, yeah. Alors, difficile de ne pas parler de musique, alors que dans vos romans, ce sont presque de véritables playlists. Vous glissez quelques références musicales, évidemment. Le groupe Slippery When Wet, avec Living on Prior, euh, Nelly Young, évidemment. Euh, mais sérieusement, Season in the Sun, de Terry Jack ah, oui. euh, C'est pas un peu kitsch Est-ce que... Est que... Can you repeat the name of the... Uh, season, season in the Sun, Kerry Jack. Ah, Kerry Jack. Oui, oui. Yeah. Uh, est-ce que la musique, est-ce que c'est la musique que vous écoutez pour écrire, is ou est-ce que c'est la musique que vous nous conseillez d'écouter Je ne sais plus où j'en suis. Ou c'est simplement la véritable uh, musique des personnages. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily listen to um, while I'm writing because when I write, I can't listen to. Uh, music with lyrics. I, I have to listen to scores, to films, and classical music, and jazz, and instrumental um, music. But uh, very often at the beginning of the book, I, I'll sit down with um, with you know a couple of albums in mind that I want the book to sound like tonally and atmospherically. Um, so that's one way that, that music kind of influences the work. And with this book in particular, it was, um, Jim Carroll Band's Catholic Boy, which is a huge, huge album in my life. And Lou Reed's New York is always a big, big influence. And then, it, you know, and then I like to give my characters, you know, I like to, to know what they're listening to. So that, that often, um, influences Uh, things in some other way. So I have a younger character, Antonina, in this book who's got a mixtape with this mortal coil and Jane's addiction and stuff, you know, from the 90s um, that she would have been listening to. Um, so, so, you know, stuff works into the book in that way uh, as well. And most importantly in this book, probably in the character of, of Donna, who, um, who loves her records very much and spends most of her time with her records and so I think that's really where um, a lot of the music references pop up in the book when she's listening to Bruce Springsteen and Garland Jeffries and Neil Young and, and her and uh, Mikey are, are bonding over that music. Uh, I don't know, I mean it's just to me in that way it's it's a way of understanding the characters, it's uh, 
it's music is a, a lifeline in my life. So I think, you know, for a character like Donna, she needs it to survive. And that was a way I really connected with her. But I also, yeah, I mean, I hope I make playlists for all my books and I hope that people listen to them and find something that they've never heard before and really love or just find something that they love and are like, oh, that guy, that guy's cool. Bon, j'ai vu aussi que vous citiez Madonna et Like a Prayer dans le book, dans le livre. <rire> Est-ce que cette idée de playlist, c'est aussi une façon de revenir aussi à un métier que vous avez pratiqué, c'est-à-dire celui de, de disquaire, euh, que j'avais cité en début de, en introduction um, I mean, I think, you know, I, I did, I, I sold records for about six or seven years, um, and I loved it, and, and it was, I mean, it was, a, my favorite thing about it was, Um, selling records I loved to people who came in looking for recommendations. Um, but um, it's not only that. I mean, I think I, I've loved the idea of this since before I even worked at a record store, just because, you know, I, I grew up in an era when uh, soundtracks were, soundtracks to films were uh, how I discovered so much of the music that I love. Um, you know, it was very, very important for me as a kid at 12 years old to, to see the film pump up the volume and discover the Pixies and Sonic Youth and Leonard Cohen and have my life altered by that soundtrack. So I think I always just loved the idea of soundtracks. And when I started writing books, I just wanted to treat it like, even though none of my books had been made into films, I wanted to treat it like I was getting to, to craft my own My own soundtrack. Alors avant de passer la, par le micro au public, s'il y avait quelques questions à, à poser à William Boy, à profiter de sa présence en tout cas. I heard you, that uh, you have a new book uh, available in USA. Oui. And it's also uh, a title of the song. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So can you tell us a few things about it? Sure. I don't know. It's called, the, the book is called Shoot the Moonlight Out and the title comes from a song I love by Garland Jeffries. Um, And it is kind of similarly structured to City of Margins. It's, um, it starts in the mid-1990s, and then we jump ahead to early 2001. Um, the book takes place over a few weeks of uh, June 2001, which, you know, un unbeknownst to any of the characters, is, is, a, is the end of an era, the end of... Uh, something in New York and, and really the world. But it's a it's a similar sprawling cast. I won't get into listing characters' names, but it's a sprawling cast, characters returning to the neighborhood, characters who, who have suffered incredible loss. Um, and a, a, at the beginning of the book, an accidental killing um, really is the is the the impetus for the the story unfolding. It's the thing from which everything folds out but yeah the, the title the title comes from um a girl and jeffrey's song uh, shoot the moonlight out which i think uh, we were talking about this which apparently is going to be highly untranslatable so it probably won't be called that when it comes out in france if it's on track with last time <laughs> okay. September, um, sure. Euh, alors moi je ne sais pas, je ne sais pas du tout quand est-ce que quand est-ce qu'il va sortir. En tout cas je sais que enfin, qu on va forcément le publier. Normalement celui-ci vient de paraître donc ce sera peut-être pour euh, 2022 ou euh, mais j'aurais dû réviser avant. Je suis plus sûr que je vérifie. Je voulais juste remercier Mandeur déjà d'être venu et que malgré le foisonnement d'événements la complexité des personnages, il arrive à nous maintenir en haleine un genre de suspense, mais qui détonne totalement des polars habituels, des polars américains. Alors, merci de votre venue. Thank you so much. Moi, je voulais souligner un point qui n'a pas été soulevé. C'est l'importance de la cuisine italienne dans tous les livres. Moi, je me suis précipitée à mon épicerie italienne. Je suis pas dans la cuisine italienne. Well, that that makes me really happy. Um, you know, in particular, and um, a friend is a gift to yourself. I think I really 
poured a lot of um, just the the what I missed about my grandmother and my grandmother's kitchen and growing and my grandfather and they were both great cooks um, and so I was just kind of uh, again haunted by the the memories of of uh, of that and, and I like to cook too and I love I love nothing more I think in you know in some ways than when when writing about food makes you want that food you know what I mean in the Jim Harrison kind of way or, or something um, so thank you yeah thank you so much that's a that's a great compliment parce que ce qui est vrai c'est que j'ai pas précisé je pensais que ça viendrait de manière plus naturelle dans la discussion mais on est au cœur de, de l'ambiance italienne. Tous les personnages ont des origines, ou semblent en tout cas des noms de consonance italienne. Et euh, peut-être un lien avec la mafia, cette ambiance. À suivre. <rire> Quelques clichés, évidemment. Yeah, I mean, just to, because it might be confusing, because people think I'm Irish because of my last name, but um, my last name is Scottish. Uh, my dad was, was born in Scotland, but I grew up only with the Italian American side of my family in, in Brooklyn. Uh, Giannini is my, my mother's maiden name. My grandparents um, were Giannini and Barba. So that, that, was the, that was the world I grew up in. Um, I didn't grow up with the, the Scottish side of my family at all. Donc, j'ai le plaisir de, de vous lire encore. Mais euh, euh, j'ai deux questions à vous poser. La première question, euh, quand vous écrivez, qu'est-ce qui est le plus important pour vous est-ce que ce sont les personnages, la complexité des personnages Est-ce que c'est l'histoire Ou est-ce que c'est euh, un récit sur euh, votre quartier Je veux pour moi, c'est toujours, je pense, une balance entre le caractère et le lieu. Ce sont les choses qui me me dans une histoire. Ce sont les choses que je réponds à. Je pense que probablement, il y a eu un long temps où j'ai was totally uninterested in plot and story. And um, I've learned to get interested in it. And, you know, I, I, I hope that I've learned to, to do it pretty well. But um, the, thing, the things that really drive the narrative for me are always character and setting. D'accord. Et donc, ma deuxième question, c'est par rapport à votre carrière d'écrivain, c'est comment vous avez appris votre métier est-ce que vous avez suivi un, des cours à l'université d'écriture Ou est-ce que vous avez appris tout seul Est-ce que vous avez suivi des masterclass euh, comme ça n'existe pas en France ou pas Oui, c'était un kind of a long, compliqué process. I, I loved, uh, I loved writing from a very young age, but I had no models for it. Um, I didn't have anybody in my family even who was a, a reader, really. I, I loved to read. I loved uh, to spend time in libraries. I, you know, I, I was reading, you know, writers in, in the newspaper in New York, uh, like Pete Hamill and, and Jimmy Breslin that I really loved. Um, so that, that was the way I think my interest kind of grew as a, as a young child. And then a lot of it along the way was just um, having to, to kind of teach myself through reading and, and, um, and then as I got older, uh, certainly by high school, I, I had teachers who introduced important books to me. Um, and then in college, I, I took some writing classes and, and had some, some important teachers in my life. Um, but then I just really, in my, in my 20s, I just kind of worked at it on my own. I still didn't really have any models of writers I knew who were out there functioning in the world as writers uh, not until I was in my you know about 30 um, and I did I did go to uh, uh, a graduate program for for writing um, when I was in my you know I guess early 30s which is where I wrote um, Gravesend my first book and I, I got to study with some some great writers there in Oxford where I live now um, and But even more important to my education, I think, was the bookstore, Square Books in Oxford, which held readings every week. Um, so writers would come through town and I would talk to them and I would kind of learn just, you know, how to how to be a writer. Um, and the older I got, the more people I knew and the more friends I had who were writers. And uh, that was all a very important part of, of my, my later development, especially.
Euh, voilà, bon, moi, je voulais dire d'abord que j'étais très surprise parce que je m'attendais à un polar dans lequel j'ai eu beaucoup de mal à rentrer. Et pour moi, le suspense, il a commencé vraiment aux deux tiers du livre. de suspense. À part ça, les personnages sont très attachants. Et, mais ce que je retiens surtout, c'est... Euh, vous avez parlé à un moment donné de l'amour qui pourrait être euh, euh, de, de aider à la rédemption, on va dire. Et à, tout à fait à la fin du livre, euh, il est question à la fois d'amour, alors je vais essayer de synthétiser, d'amour et de musique, puisque Donna dit, on, et moi ça m'a ça beaucoup interpellé, on peut vivre dans une chanson, et, euh, et elle dit aussi que c'est l'amour, alors je n'ai pas le texte sous les yeux exactement, mais euh, c'est l'amour qui permet d'être au-dessus de tout, qui permet de s'élever au-dessus de tout. Et il y a un autre petit passage du livre qui m'a interpellée, c'est quand euh, quelqu'un dit à Mikey, tu dois suivre, euh, tu dois suivre ce qui est la voie que tu, tu choisis euh, sans discuter euh, ce qu'on te dit de faire. Et puis, euh, parce que dans ce livre, on a l'impression quand même que tous les personnages ont les pieds dans la glu. Mmh. avec des rêves euh, au-dessus et qui ne peuvent pas atteindre que tous ces faits pour les empêcher de vivre ces rêves. Voilà. Donc, c'est un peu j'ai voulu ce que vous avez dit. Merci. 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 Again, I liked having that kind of threaded through um, books that also involve crime and violence and, and all of uh, these other um, grief and loss and regret, all this other stuff. Um, but City Margins in particular, I think there's, there's really kind of multiple through lines when it comes to the love stories. There's, there's not only Donna and Ava, but more importantly, there's Mikey and Donna, and then there's um, Antonina and um, Satil, Ralph Satil, um, who are kind of have a father-daughter love story, sort of in a weird way. So yeah, that that's important for me to to think about that. And um, again, with Donna, I think I put a lot of my my love of music and the way I feel about um, that into into that character who is um, a character I really, really loved and worried about and wondered about. Pour conclure sur la musique, on peut dire aussi que cette euh, playlist que vous proposez amène à penser que la, la meilleure chose qui peut arriver à, à vos livres, c'est la consécration d'être trans transcrit au cinéma aussi rapidement. Yeah, thank you. I, I would, I would, I, I, I hope it happens. I and mean, I hope um, if it happens, somebody who is, you know, bright for it does it. But I don't, I don't know if it will ever happen. <laughs> but I like that the, the, the sound of the story exists anyway. So you can kind of imagine it um, as I would, would have intended it. Alors, fuit Cripou, amour de jeunesse meurtri, futur incertain, sexe un peu, alcool beaucoup, violence toujours. La Cité des Marges est un ouvrage qui porte la détresse d'une Amérique en perdition et l'espoir en bandoulière. Vous foutez le bordel au cliché pour porter avec humour un roman noir qui tourne à la romance. La morale est sauf car le meurtre est un manque de savoir-vivre et l'alcool son carburant. L'amour est sauf quand le sexe dépasse la nécessité. Votre, écru, votre écriture est empreinte de l'Amérique des clichés, le rythme est loin de l'action, pourtant les pages se tournent avec délectation et les clichés valsent au gré des rythmes des pédistes. William Boy, merci pour vos réponses. Merci aussi à Clotilde pour la traduction. Merci à Gail Master pour avoir permis à William Boy de venir à l'Ève. Merci à Radio Lodev pour la diffusion de cette rencontre et tout particulièrement à Anne pour la technique. Merci à Nathan pour le montage vidéo de la rencontre et sa mise en ligne. Vous pourrez donc retrouver cette rencontre et ainsi que les précédentes sur le site de la librairie www.1.3.fr. Je remercie aussi la DRAC et Occitanie Livre pour leur soutien à la librairie 1.3. Merci.
au public d'être là aussi. Merci à vous et à bientôt.